Hi there, I'm Dr. Glenn Vanass. It's a pleasure to present to you on Dental XP on the topic of laser and recovery of dental implants. I'm a general dentist, practices in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I have uh, a, a mastership in laser dentistry. I've been using lasers in the operating microscope since 1997. It's uh, a pleasure to present to Dental XP on the topic of lasers and uh, their role in, in implantology. The topic of lasers and dental implantology is growing interest. There's a lot of research coming out on a lot of topics of the, how lasers can be used in the implants, particularly in periimplantitis. Uh, and today we're going to cover a little bit of a different topic. We're going to talk about how lasers can be used for their role in helping with uncovery uh, during stage two. When you look at lasers, uh, really there are four different wavelengths of lasers in dentistry right now. Soft tissue diodes, which run between 810 and 980 nanometers. ND YAGs, which are uh, quite popular for their role in periodontics. Uh, the Erbium family, which are hard tissue or all tissue lasers, which allow you to cut not only soft tissue, but they can cut bone, dentin, enamel, uh, and soft tissue as well. And soft tissue lasers uh, that are CO2. Uh, those CO2 lasers um, primarily cut soft tissue, but a new wavelength of CO2 is out that will also cut hard tissue. And these four wavelengths make up the bulk of the dental lasers that are available in today's marketplace. We're going to focus uh, in the uncovery portion of the lecture on the role of diodes and erbium lasers for uncovery. Uh, that's not to say that the NDEAG and CO2 lasers cannot be used. They can, and in fact, CO2 lasers can be quite quick. But the cases I'll show you are, in fact, diode lasers and erbium heart tissue lasers. When you look at wavelengths in dentistry, there are a number of different ones. They can become quite confusing out there, actually. Uh, we're going to focus on the left-hand side on diode lasers that can be used uh, to uncover um, some particular implants where tissue needs to be removed and not moved. And the erbium family will cover uh, the erbium chromium, YSGG. I'll show you a couple cases using that particular wavelength. Uh, that's commonly known as the water laser, biolase, that particular uh, erbium chromium wavelength. When you look at lasers in implant dentistry, there's a growing interest in uh, the role of lasers. And um, uh, Roman Ost and his group uh, in 2013 in implant dentistry came out with it, an article. It was a review paper looking at how lasers could be used. Um, he characterized several different procedures, including uh, periimplantitis therapy, soft tissue periimplant surgery, uh, both at abutment stage and uh, during uncovery, laser assisted osteotomy, where hard tissue lasers were used to um, start the osteotomy process, uh, laser radiation to accelerate osteointegration. Diode lasers have the capability, uh, and when used at very low settings, to actually improve early wound healing and also early bone to implant contact on fixtures. Uh, um, many lasers are hemostatic in nature and can uh, decrease uh, bleeding uh, during the procedures. You'll see that in, in some of the video I'm going to show you. Photodynamic therapy and implantology, which is gaining uh, interest in the treatment of mucositis. Um, laser assisted welding for dental laboratory technology. And finally, the promotion of wound healing. This article is an excellent review of uh, various procedures that different wavelengths could be utilized in laser dentistry. Um, I prefer to characterize the role of lasers by the timing of the procedure itself. So um, I find that um, when I'm looking at how lasers can be used in implant dentistry, I like to look at it by the stage of the procedure. So if you're going to use lasers prior to placement, they can be used very effectively for disinfection of extraction sockets. Uh, if there's granulation tissue inside the extraction sockets or if there's uh, the fear of bacteria inside the um, extraction sockets, all lasers are antibacterial and they can be used to remove uh, uh, chronically inflamed granulation tissue and also to disinfect and um, reduce bacterial counts within the extraction sockets. Uh, lateral windows have been done with sinus lifts, uh, for, for sinus lifts with hard tissue lasers. Uh, when you look at during implant placement, lasers are effective for flap incision, as you'll see in one of the videos. They can be utilized for laser-assisted osteotomies, for decortication for GBR procedures. After the actual implant has been placed, low-level laser therapy can be helpful for helping with uh, early osteointegration and wound healing, and hard tissue lasers can be used to level bone around fixtures if necessary. 
What we're going to cover today is really the role of lasers in uncovery, and I'm going to differentiate between manhole or trapdoor uncoveries, as I like to call them. Lasers can be used after the prosthetic phase or during the prosthetic phase for soft tissue peri-implant surgery uh, that help a lot with either getting the initial crowns to be seated uh, to remove soft tissue around implants or if crowns come off during the um, post-restorative phase, uh, they can be utilized to really help remove soft tissue around the abutments to get your crowns back in. Finally, after prosthetics, there's a very uh, tremendous amount of research looking at the role of lasers for the treatment of peri -implant plantitis. Uh, that is something that I cover in other portions of the lectures, uh, but photodynamic therapy and regular implants are being utilized to remove granulation tissue off fixtures, to disinfect the site, to remove infected coatings uh, such as Tie Unite, and research that has been out in the last 18 months shows that um, bone can regrow on these osseointegrated um, implants uh, if the lasers are used to disinfect the site. So there's some exciting research happening in for the treatment of peri-implantitis and the role of lasers for those the, that particular procedure. Today we're going to cover uh, really the role of lasers in uncovery. I'm going to tell you uh, briefly a couple, uh, show you a couple cases and explain to you how uh, lasers are making headway for the uncovery phases. When you look, we as clinicians love to, to gain primary stability and to put all our implants in, in one stage and, and avoid as much as possible the second stage of uh, recovery. Unfortunately, two-stage recovery or two-stage surgery where recovery is necessary is required if our primary stability is so low, if there's less than two millimeters of soft tissue above the bony crest, or if bone grafting was done at the time of surgical placement, we often have to bury our, our fixtures. Lasers are wonderful because they can control hemostasis at stage two uncovery. They're safe to use around implants. Uh, there's much research to show that um, lasers, uh, when used judiciously, can help to uh, reduce or avoid sutures, allowing for fixture level impressions on the same day as uncovery. You can see on the right hand side here, one of the cases I'll be covering, uh, where we use two different techniques. Uh, the uh, first premolar is had enough attached tissue and we uh, removed the tissue itself uh, using a diode laser and in the, um, uh, the more distal two fixtures uh, we did a trapdoor approach where we used a hard tissue laser to swing and roll the buckle the tissue towards the buckle to gain greater attached tissue. Um, I've written several articles on different uh, aspects of lasers in dentistry and done some webinars um, in this particular article in Dentistry Today, uh, I mentioned that second stage surgery is needed at times and it can be accomplished through many methods. Many of you are using punch biopsy techniques, uh, traditional flap using uh, traditional methods of uh, uh, sutures and uh, scalpels and uh, the buckle roll technique. Lasers can really help in many cases simplify the uncovery situations, providing for improvements in hemostasis with less reliance on sutures. Uh, some clinicians I know out there have told me I've got an old monopolar electrosurge to uncover implants and I'm telling you, if you only take one thing out of this, please don't do this. Um, Massey's group in Italy uh, looked at thermal explantation using monopolar electrosurge. And what they did is they um, purposely used electrosurge to extract uh, 20 successive implants that needed to be removed. These Im implants were unable to be removed with 35 newtons of, of uh, counter-rotational force. So what they did, they brought the electrosurge over for three seconds without anesthetic and touched the fixture directly with the, the uh, uh, monopolar electrosurge. Two weeks later, after they covered it up again with a healing abutment, all implants were, re were able to be removed with a reverse torque of less than 35 newton centimeters. So what they actually proposed was, uh, they actually proposed this as a method of using electrosurge as a quick, reliable, easy and safe method for fixture removal. Uh, there was minimal bone necrosis when they looked at the histology around the fixture. It's a very small zone of necrosis and they suggested this would be uh, a successful way of removing fixtures without trephining them out or using implant re, uh, rotation tools. So when you look at that, a soft tissue diode laser is a very small, effective, cost-effective method. Many of them are in the three to $5,000 range, and they are portable, offer you an alternative technique for uncovering dental implants. Uh, Ye and his group in 2005 presented an article that looked at two cases in which four dental implants were uncovered using a soft tissue diode laser. The te technique provides an efficient, patient-friendly method to perform second-stage implant surgery and allows for a safe, 
um, and faster often rehabilitative phase because you often don't need as many sutures or any sutures to close the area. Uh, as I mentioned in 2011 I wrote on this particular topic and, and differentiated between using a diode laser to uncover the implant with a manhole type technique where really the tissue is just removed in a circular fashion over top of the, um, the implant. And this removes uh, and not moves the tissue and so you have to have enough attached and keratinized tissue to make this work. It's best suited this technique for posterior regions where uh, the tissue is its not an aesthetic concern where you have adequate soft tissue and you simply want to remove directly the uh, soft tissue over top. And remember, the tissue is not moved, it's not a roll technique, it's just removed to gain access to the fixture. If there's bone over, over top of your fixture and you're using a diode, the diode laser will not remove bone. You'll either need a chisel, a burr, or in some cases a hard tissue laser depending on your, your choice of technique. Here you see in this particular case an upper first premolar that had to be buried because it was not enough primary stability. You can see the fixture in place and you can see here um, after healing on the right hand side we're now ready, there's lots of attached tissue to uh, uncover this. So what we did, we took our surgical stent, we knew where the implant was, we prepared on a probe, we probe, and we're now using a diode laser just to uncover the cover screw that you see here. Um, there are some studies from uh, Romanos and others that suggest you have to be a little careful with heat buildup. So I typically tend to use lower settings, one watt or less, initiated tip, continuous wave, and use it either in a sewing needle fashion, up and down, or gradually exposing the cover screw, as you can see here, uh, to um, uh, unscrew it and then place our uh, compression post in. Every 15 to 20 seconds you should stop and blow some water onto the site just to keep the area cool. On the right hand side you can see the uncovered uh, healing cap and at this point you can unscrew that and uh, as you can uh, see a okay, clear view hurting. without any bleeding and you're able to remove the um, healing cap take your impressions. Two weeks later, you can see the healing with the, the uh, healing cap in place. We're ready to put our final restoration, and this is the uh, upper left uh, first premolar, and you can see the uh, nice response to the tissue to this uh, cemented Emax crown. So manhole is typically used in the posterior aspect of the mouth. Um, often, we do not have enough attached tissue, and then you have to look at alternative techniques. Um, in 2010, this article by Arnabat Dominguez and Aol looked at, at how to uncover using a hard tissue laser. This was in fact the Erbium Chromium uh, uh, YSGG wavelength. And what they did was they made what I call a trap door, uh, where the incision was made with the laser on the mesial, palatal, and distal, as you can see on the right hand side. And the tissue was rolled up and off the cover screw and rolled towards the buckle. You can apply sutures to it if required. Uh, I've used also glue stitch or periacryl to simply tack the soft tissue down in this particular position. If it's a large amount of soft tissue that you wish to remove, you can de-epithelialize the uh, surface, the epithelium, uh, if, you, if you wish. Uh, you can tuck it in then at that point to not only uh, roll the tissue to the buckle, but actually increase the thickness on the buckle aspect. You can see a case here where we did three implants in the upper right, upper first premolar, upper uh, second premolar, and upper first molar. You can see there is a lack of attached tissue on the upper second premolar and upper first molar. The first molar required a sinus lift, a crestal approach, and so the uh, indirect sinus lift was done with a um, a kit from Hyosin, uh, it's called the CAS kit, and so that was uh, done during the surgical phase. We're now at the phase of uncovering, and what we do is we put a periodontal probe into the surgical uh, guide, and we're able to, on the left-hand side, create three bleeding spots where we know our fixtures are located. In the middle photo, you can see that, as mentioned earlier, the trap door uh, approach has been used for the two distal uh, sites and the mesial site where the first premolar was had enough attached tissue and we were able to just simply expose that. We're now going to roll the tissue to the buckle, take an impression for a provisional and um, 
you can see immediately after the healing caps have been placed in, this is in the day that the patients had the exposure done, and the patient leaves, and in this case, I did not tack down the soft tissue on the buckle. The patient was reassigned for two weeks to place provisional restorations, and you can see at the two-week healing period, you can see that the soft tissue is still granulating in from the paddle aspect, but that we're gaining attachment of uh, keratinized tissue on the buckle. The healing caps were removed. You can see the nice healing that's taken place after only two weeks, and provisional restorations were placed. If you look in the middle photo, you can see the increase in attached tissue that's occurred for both the second premolar and the first molar by rolling the tissue over to the buckle. The screw retained provisional was inserted and allowed, allowed the tissue to heal for a couple of months. The time of the final cementation, it was decided to place a uh, cemented restoration because of the position of the first molar. The access hole was going to be too far towards the buckle. And you can see here <coughs> stock abutments and uh, the final three unit splinted uh, crowns that were placed onto the abutments. And here's the provisional, so you can see the nice healing that, was, that had occurred um, both on the buckle view and on the occlusal view. The tissue is healed very nicely. We've got increased uh, keratinized tissue, and now we place our abutments in. And in addition here, you can see the final restorations um, uh, with the nice porcelain work that was done uh, by the lab, lab tech and the cemented three-unit uh, restoration. So again, we're able to use the laser, uh, in this case uh, a hard tissue laser, to expose the uh, cover screws and, um, and get a nice result. Here you can see the final radiographs with the uh, three uh, fixtures and the most posterior fixture being uh, into the sinus with a crestal approach to the sinus having been done. In this particular case, uh, one of the last two I'm going to show, it's an upper lateral where the crown fractured off. It was temporary, temporarily replaced. This is an upper right lateral incisor. Uh, these are 20-year-old crowns, and discussion was made with the patient for different treatment choices. The patient chose to have a, an implant placed, and um, unfortunately, we were unable to obtain enough primary stability to put a uh, restoration in. So we let this heal for three months uh, with a uh, flipper partial in place, and you can see after three months that we're now ready to uncover. So this is a hard tissue laser. It's a BioLase laser, and it's a Erbium Chromium YSGG. You see some vertical incisions that are being made after, with the crestal incision as well to uncover this so that we can um, uncover the implant, which was uh, very quite deep as you can see. One of the nice things is using the laser for incisions, you can see the relative lack of bleeding that occurs. The fine mist that comes out really washes away the uh, uh, any uh, vascularity and that really keeps the uh, bleeding down to a minimum. Uh, the wavelength and the pulse duration are such that really you get good coagulation using this wavelength. We've now uh, opened up the soft tissue, raised the flap, and now we're using the same laser but we're using a uh, NZ6 kit to remove bone. Copious amounts of water is, is being used. We're using laser about 4 watts of energy to uncover the fixture that is buried. You can see just now the fixture coming into play. Now what we're, we're hoping to do is remove the bone safely around the implant and be able to remove bone over top of the fixture and expose our, our cover screw. You can see here as we progress along, the cover screw is uh, becoming exposed. And we're using the laser to, uh, to be able to remove the bone that's over top and um, be able to gain full access to our, our fixture. Finally, we're able to remove the cover screw, place a provisional in, and be able to create a provisional for this particular area to uh, shape the soft tissue. You can see here the uh, immediate post-operative with the uh, uh, provisional crown in place. And you can see here two-week healing, as this case is ongoing. You can see the two-week healing uh, of the uh, the uh, restoration. The final case I'm going to show is a, a ridge split case where we place two implants in the lower left. The lower right has a single tooth implant connected to a, a, a distal molar, but in fact that's 25 years old, that particular restoration, so we sometimes have to be careful as clinicians not to judge from just a panorex how long something's been in the mouth. 
Uh, it's not a case that I did, but uh, I inherited, and uh, that particular uh, restoration has, has been in place for 25 years. So on the bottom left, we placed two implants in a ridge split, and uh, we're now going to use the uh, laser on the right-hand side, to, as you'll see, to uncover it. So here's the healing after around uh, four months or so. Crestal incision with uh, some verticals is made, and um, this is uh, actually, sorry, this is the initial ridge split, and you can see the... Uh, implants being placed here. These are two hyacin fixtures that were placed and, and uh, these were buried with grafting that was done in the ridge split. And you see the closure with uh, uh, cytoplast sutures and gore sutures there. And here's the post-operative panorex. So now this is the healing and four months later we're ready to uncover the, the, the implants and we're now using a hard tissue laser. These lasers run in the $70,000 range and you can see the relative lack of bleeding as the incision is made to uh, make a trapdoor incision over both these implants. We know where the implants are located from our surgical stent and we use the uh, laser at a two and a half watts with a lot of water just to create uh, an incision. Some people prefer to go uh, quicker or make a speedy incision. Um, speed isn't something that I'm concerned about. I want to have a, a nice result and we're, we're using the laser to make a full uh, flap, just a little trap door that we can, um, we can move uh, that tissue over towards the buckle. After that's done, you can see the two little trap doors and the exposure that is there. We took an impression directly of this to send to the lab for some provisionals. And here are the impression with an open tray. Here's the impressions themselves, and we rolled the tissue towards the buckle. You see here now the tissue with the cover screws in place. We've rolled the tissue to the buckle and just tacked them down with some glue stitch, which is periacral. This case is ongoing, so I'll just show you the uh, the provisional restorations we had on the uh, on the first molar to provide a lingual set screw because that particular implant was placed more towards the lingual. But you can see the one week healing of the soft tissue that's occurred here just from simply rolling the soft tissue with the lasers over. So I want to thank you for your attention on this sh short, brief discussion on uh, utilizing different laser wavelengths for uncovery. Um, we hopefully will be able to provide you with further uh, discussion on some of the other topics in my categories on things like such as peri-implantitis or the role of lasers in GBR or sinus uh, lifts. Uh, it's always a pleasure to provide some information for Dental XP. Uh, and my email is uh, glennvanass at me.com should you have any further questions. Thanks again and hope to see you soon.